Thank you, Frank. And the next question comes from Dean DeRusso. And that'll be followed by Rita Strawbar. And the question goes first to David Crimmin. First of all, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. I know it was hard to get in touch with you guys, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm very happy to see you. I'm really concerned about this bill brought to the table called the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2008. And uh, in the past, uh, you know, the technology has been brought about uh, with deaf and hard of hearing people. Uh, for example, with television, the sizes of 13 inches and smaller, uh, but there was no technology available. And now we have technology available and it is advancing immensely. And you know, this is the 21st century, and so this bill is coming along, and there's different advocates for different accessibility issues. You know, for example, hearing aids, the internet, and several programs, internet programs. I'm wondering if you are supporting this bill. I haven't uh, yet seen this bill, but uh, I'm, uh, I would uh, look at it as a, Again, we, if government provides the infrastructure for the benefits of all people, and uh, again, for the small amount of, uh, of it's uh, just a matter now of tweaking technology before it begins, uh, I'm all for that. If uh, the all of its uh, if it requires billions of dollars, the the investment uh, it would have a definite payback, and I think it would be worthwhile again for the quality of life of the people and the ability to employ people. And for, uh, and for the betterment of all. Thank you. Mr. Massa. Well, thank you, and I have to apologize. I have not had an opportunity to read that particular piece of legislation, although by this time tomorrow, I guarantee you I will. The reality is, and again, as we face challenges today, with the news media absolutely overcome with Wall Street's inability to continue basic financial resources to this country. We are going to face a fight. We're going to face a fight between the needs of the many and the desires of the few. We're going to face a fight about acting quickly instead of acting correctly. And the amounts of money that we're talking about today will decide, frankly, what will be accessible and what programs we can fund in the future. That is why it is so important we get these critical decisions right and right the first time under an umbrella of government whose fundamental focus is on the needs of those people who have needs. For the past eight years, we've made billionaires out of millionaires and that has to stop. And unless we understand the role of government at the federal level, nothing will stop. And all of the specifics that we try to use to make things better won't be there. So let's have a clean break with the past. Let's start anew and bring a government of change to Washington, D.C. Okay, Mr. Sweetland. I'm not aware of that bill either. And um, I can tell you that 14 years in the Onondaga County Legislature, five spent as chairman of the county legislature. In any piece of legislation, the devil is always in the details. And therefore, I would be hesitant on any issue or any specific legislation that's before Congress today to say whether or not I would support it. Because without knowing the details, it would be difficult to, to say, yes, I support it, and then read it and find out that uh, something was in there that I couldn't support. Um, I have experience with that. People expect you to do that, but when you finally get to the product, after it gets ground up by government and ground up in debate, many times the ultimate goal may still be the same, but it's not achieved by the details of the legislation and the wording of the legislation. So I would reserve judgment on that at this point. And hey, Mr. Maffei. 
Uh, well, actually, I am familiar with this legislation. <clears throat> it is a bipartisan bill sponsored by Ed Markey of Massachusetts and uh, Heather Wilson, a Republican from New Mexico. Um, I think it is a very good piece of legislation. I'm not saying that there couldn't be changes that might make it better. But what it does is it ensures that um, the, the Internet uh, provided telephone services and video services would be um, accessible uh, to the deaf and, and hearing impaired, as well as to uh, blind people who are blind and, and other people with disabilities in a way that it isn't currently now. Uh, the gentleman, uh, the previous gentleman who asked the question, talked about how important American Sign Language is. And indeed, American Sign Language is always going to be a, a key language and one that uh, people in the hearing world should should try to learn, I think, many cases. But for the new generation, uh, the Internet is such a key device. And indeed, our television and our telephone service are going to be converging and to make sure that this tool uh, is accessible to people with disabilities and particularly deaf Americans is absolutely vital again to ensuring that um, that people have good lives and most fulfilling lives with this technology and also of course that our economy is as good as it can be with uh, with people working so um, I certainly support uh, what the legislation uh, tries to do and uh, I do would like to listen to my constituents um, and uh, in a new Congress try to uh, get behind legislation or similar legislation that maybe would do the same thing and be even better. Okay, and Dean, are you happy with the answers? Thank you very much for your honesty. And I'm looking forward to reading your information, and uh, you reading the information, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Okay, next we have Rita Strabar, followed by Tom Rako, and the question goes first to Eric Massa. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Hi, I am Rita Strawbar, and uh, my question is a little similar to what Dean just presented. My question is regarding captioning. Wondering if, when you're watching television, if you had no sound and no captioning, if you were trying to watch it, would you feel like you were knowing what was going on? You know, years ago that was how deaf and hard of hearing people lived. Now today we have captioning and you know with decoders and so on uh, that was the old technology for television and now with new technology uh, it has it's, it's much better and now with this digital uh, I'm wondering how that's going to fit with this new d technology with digital. Many broadcast televisions have captioning that is true but the problem is with cable, there's not too many that have captioned programs. So we're feeling not included in here. You know, we're paying for this. However, you know, where is the accessibility to our hearing peers? Perhaps you can benefit from captioning as well. Uh, you know, you go into a bar or a restaurant or you're in the waiting room, you know, and uh, the TV is not loud, audible where you can hear it and you're trying to read the captioning, but, you know, so perhaps you could benefit in other ways as we do. Uh, perhaps you're, you know, have people who are from another country, Denmark or so on, they're trying to learn English and uh, they could benefit from the captioning as well, not just those of us who are deaf and hard of hearing, it's not just a deaf issue. I'm wondering also how you might, you know, improve the accessibility to captioning not only with television but on the web. Uh, there are lots of videos, movies brought up on the internet and there is slight, little captioning. And again, we're paying for cable television and we're paying for internet services and yet there's no captioning available. So wondering how you would address improving this service for deaf, hard of hearing, uh, you know, people from other countries and yourselves included. Mr. Massey. Rita, thank you so much because it brings a smile to my face. I was recently uh, rushed to an airport following a television interview that I did and I watched my entire interview and read what I said. It was a new experience for me, to say the very least. And what you've captured is a wonderful bridge of commonality between two communities. You know, there's no reason 
that with the wonderful things that we're seeing, and we have a great break point coming up in the next two years with mandated digital television, that there cannot be greater mandated universal access to the technology that you're mentioning. And I really love the way you put your question because it brought it to life across two communities. And it made me remember an experience that I had just two weeks ago. So I think you hit a very, very good point right on the head. And it speaks to, frankly, a broader issue. And that broader issue is the role of how the federal government can not only find that bridge of commonality, but here's the hard part. And here's where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> fund it. If we can find hundreds of billions of dollars to bail out corporate Wall Street executives who have failed in their, in their basic fiduciary responsibility, I think this nation can find a very small fraction of that to increase the quality of life for all of its citizens. But that's not going to happen under the current regime. And so while your story brings a smile to my face because it brings a sense of commonality of experience, that commonality of experience, trust me, is not being shared by folks in Washington, D.C. So thank you for your question. I absolutely believe in greater access of universal captioning, and I think it serves many in a broader social context. Mr. Sweetland. I think that you're absolutely right, it, uh, and I agree with Mr. Massa that uh, technology has come a long way. Technology needs to go the next step further, and the research and development of technology will enhance everyone's life, and uh, including deaf people. Uh, you know, some of us have experienced it at some point in time. I had a TV that all of a sudden the, the sound wouldn't work. And so I sat there watching TV and felt just like I was in the dark. And so I do know exactly how you, how you feel. And I didn't, I didn't replace that TV for a long period of time. I think also it, uh, it gives me, I thought to myself during that time that uh, I wonder if, any, if many of us are as good a reader as we need to be because uh, I was in a setting where there was a TV in a very crowded place and people were trying to follow the captioning um, that was scrolling across the TV and they couldn't keep up. So uh, the oftentimes I think that uh, things, things need to move ahead, things need to go ahead. But what I do really agree with Mr. Massa is a discussion needs to go on, a debate needs to go on about what is the role of government what should government do? And many times, many times, that's what this government doesn't do. It hasn't done it for many years, and we need to get this government in the mode that says that's what your job is. That's what we sent you there for. Do your job. Mr. Maffei. Yes, the legislation that the previous questioner was talking about um, does have provisions for making sure that uh, programs on the Internet delivered through the Internet um, and through cable um, will be uh, will have closed captions that sets the standard as a standard FCC standard where a broadcast program, whenever a broadcast program would be required to have those captions, then it would follow the same if it was delivered on the Internet or on cable. Um, I think this is a good idea. I think it's. Uh, you know, the technology is getting easier and easier, so it's not a particularly a draconian uh, requirement. Um, I, too, uh, use closed captions, um, even though I'm, I'm not a person with uh, significant hearing loss. But uh, as has been reported in this campaign already, um, I uh, am a bit of a nerd, and I like some science fiction programs. And a lot of the terms are sort of technical, and sometimes the dialogue gets hard to follow. Uh, but if I put the closed captioning on, it's much easier for me to follow the plot of the program. So I, I, I agree with you completely. I think that the closed captions um, have many, many uses beyond simply uh, opening up more of our great information, uh, uh, information society uh, to people, uh, to deaf Americans. Um, I think they help open it up to many other Americans as well. So it certainly needs to be a priority. And I think that piece of the legislation might be the most important part, part of it. And I'll certainly support it and try to uh, make it even more comprehensive if possible. And Mr. Kremen. Yeah, I also agree that uh, that the public airwaves and this bill is just coming up, and the new technology is changing over. This would be the perfect time to uh, implement the new technology through the bill. Um, I 
I know, Mona, I won't say who is, but I have a family member whose uh, hearing has become very weak and now needs to use the captioning. And uh, yes, I would do everything possible to get it included. Okay, Rita, if you're fine, we can squeeze in one more question if we start now. Are you okay? I wanted to thank WXXI for this wonderful forum. Thank you to the congressman. Thank you uh, for those of you in the deaf community as well for this wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you. And Tom Rako, if we can keep the question very brief, we can squeeze it in. We're getting really close, but we're, we're trying very hard. And we're asking the candidates to limit it to one minute each. That way we can kind of do this one as well. And the question goes to um, Dale Sweetland. I'm not known for being brief. But, um, <laughs> I'm here because my wife is deaf and I have many uh, deaf friends and, and uh, colleagues at work, and my topic is public transportation. Tens of thousands of deaf and hard of hearing Americans use the airways and railways every day, yet their access to important, sometimes essential information is not available to them the same way it is to those who are hearing. In airports and railways, frequent announcements are made that directly impact on their ability to board transportation in a timely and orderly fashion. On trains and planes, even more essential information is delivered by voice, and deaf and hard of hearing passengers are left unaware or at risk because they have no access to directions or required actions other than to watch other passengers and try to understand what's required of them. In a sense, they become, they become children to others, which is not fair to them. In all of this, they still are required to pay the same rates for less service and potentially reduce safety. Even here in Rochester at the airport, Rochester at the airport, where we have a per capita uh, deaf population that's very, very large. We have some uh, essential services that aren't even available to them. What can you as our legislators do to fix the situation and better ensure that all of our citizens are given the same opportunities to use and enjoy public transportation safely and without a sense of discrimination? I think we have about 45 seconds or less, please. I think very quickly, be an advocate. Um, Disabled people, people with um, children with Down syndrome, deaf people experience things that, that other people don't in their daily lives. And I think that just listening and being an advocate is the, is the main reason why representatives are sent to governments to help those populations that need that help. Uh, yes, um, I think this is a, an equal rights issue, uh, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act issue, and certainly in the spirit of that, uh, it's absolutely essential that we include uh, visual cues as well. I think self-sufficiency is an extremely important part of any person's self-esteem, and so we really want to uh, pay a lot of attention to that. And I have to say, just again, from my own experience, particularly in airports, when you never know when your flight is boarding, even as a hearing person, it would do a lot of good if there were more visual cues, um, uh, you know, boards and Cetera, that could be depended on as well. So I think this is something that would help all of society. Yeah, I would be in favor, uh, again, of eliminating any barrier of entry to, uh, to uh, any form of transportation, air, rail, or whatever. Uh, and I know that it's, uh, on many, oca uh, many occasions, I know several senior citizens who've had limiting situations and they uh, called in advance and the airlines or whatever have made accommodations to have someone come for them and help them out in certain instances. Uh, but I would do everything possible to uh, to remove the barriers of entry. Tom, thank you for your question, and thank you for your wonderful and loving advocacy for your wife and for the community of which you are a part. There's no doubt that there's imagination uh, beyond our ability to capture tonight about how visual cues can make public transportation safer, whether it's flashing signals at a boarding ramp at an airport, whether it's very lighting, especially in the evening or during daytime on buses or trains. We should not limit ourselves just to the inability of our own communities, but rather reach out across broad spectrum. So again, I think that other members of this panel have captured it very, very well. It's a matter about reaching out and being concerned and capturing all those great ideas and incorporating them in the spirit of the American Disabilities Act. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. We now invite the candidates to deliver a closing statement. The order of statements was determined by a random drawing. We will, they will deliver their closing statement. First statement goes to Mr. Massa. One minute, please. Thank you very much for allowing us to share this time with you tonight. 
When I was 38 years old, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer and given four months to live. And in the 18 months of the treatment of the chemotherapy, I lost my hearing in both ears for six months. It was almost a miraculous, in fact, I consider it to be recovery. I cannot sit here today and tell you that I understand all the challenges that everyone in the hearing impaired community face, but I certainly had a small taste of it. And that small taste has led me to believe that whether you hear or not, as well hearing people can or don't, we all have to open our ears and listen. It's that life's experience that I hope to bring to Washington, D.C., across all of the constituencies that I hope to represent. Thank you for the time tonight. God bless you in good health in the future and beyond. The next statement comes from David Crimmin. Again, thank you, everyone, for allowing me to attend tonight. Um, and if I, if I were, am lucky enough to ever get elected, uh, I am a listener. Uh, one of the first things I did before, after I got the nomination was informally go out and listen to 100 different people without telling them why, what their issues were, what they were talking about, to see what was really on the minds of the people of the area. And uh, being from the background from Alliance Club, which our primary thrust is the, uh, the uh, blind, but we also have the hearing impaired, I would do anything possible to assist in this area. The next statement comes from Dan Maffei. Uh, thank you. Um, I am very excited about the, the uh, opportunity right now to turn this region and this country around. Uh, and I do believe we have the capacity to meet these challenges, but only if we work together. We, we cannot afford to uh, take any segment of the society or any group and leave them behind. It's, we simply need everybody on board in order to do this. We talked a lot tonight about various issues of access and uh, uh, to the economy, to the internet. This is absolutely essential. Again, not just for the people who are getting this access, us, but for all of us to make sure that we do have a society in which everyone participates and an economy in which in which everybody is pushing it forward. Um, I do believe that uh, being a representative is not just a, jo a job description. It's a job. It's not just a job title. It's a job description. And that means uh, listening to everybody in the community. I, for one, am very happy to have taken part in this forum because um, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned uh, ironically, I think we've learned a lot about listening um, from the deaf American community here. And, uh, and I tend to be a representative in Congress who will listen very carefully and try to include everybody working across party lines to do the best we can to re revitalize and change this region. And thank the you. final statement comes from Dale Sweetland. Thank you. And thank you again to uh, WXXI and the sponsors for hosting this event. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here this evening. I, too, learned a great deal. And I want to impress upon you that the House of representatives is the people's house. It is the, it is the segment of government that is supposed to send people, regular people, not millionaires, not billionaires, to Congress to represent people for two years. It's not meant to be a career. It's meant to be people who live and work among their constituency and listen to their needs. I, want, I did learn an awful lot tonight, and I look forward to representing you in the future. Thanks very much for your time. Okay. Thank you for participating in this congressional forum, which was adapted for the deaf and hard of hearing citizens. Support for this forum came from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Public Media Innovation Fund. For more about WXXI's efforts to improve accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing citizens during election 08, please go to our website, wxxi.org slash citizen, and check on Civic Sense. Thank you to our partners in this project, the National Institute for the Deaf at Rochester Institute of Technology, Rochester Hearing and Speech Center, and the Center for Disability Rights. I'm Peter Reglinski. Good night.